Okay, well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Craig McInnes. I'm the co-CEO at uh, MyCaribou, and I'll be moderating today's session uh, with Mark, Les Mark as well. Uh, MyCaribou is a partner management platform built specifically for medical device manufacturers and distributors that will help you accelerate your growth in markets around the world. Uh, just as a quick background, I will provide a short presentation at the end for anyone like to stay on and have a look at the platform. Uh, but basically, it is, uh, as you can see on the screen, it provides the ability to match and connect with 20,000 distributors and 20,000 manufacturers in over 125 countries. It also allows you to navigate market data in over 100 countries, collaborate with your existing and new partners in secure workspaces that include things like sales forecasting, file sharing discussions, and business reviews. And lastly, monitor and measure your uh, partner and market performance in markets all around the world. So as I said, I'll do a quick demo at the end of the presentation today. I always like to give a little bit of background on uh, the attendees today. So we have hundreds of companies signed up from over 50 countries on six continents. And you can see the breakdown uh, geographically of where today's attendees are coming from. Uh, we always experiment a little bit with the timing. Hopefully this time works well, uh, early, a little bit early in North America, but um, uh, hopefully a good fit for certainly European countries, as you can see, that are well represented here on the presentation. Uh, now, I would just ask, we're going to make sure people ask questions in the Q&A panel as we go along. And we're looking for some uh, great questions from the group today uh, as, as we go through the presentation. Uh, now, let me introduce you to today's speaker. So Mark Lesselroth is the president and CEO of Bioport USA, which is a consulting firm that facilitates market entry for life sciences companies into the massive US market. Mark has been a featured presenter at many conferences, including Medica, which is where we met actually, and is a peer reviewer for the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Mark is also an active participant in several life science clusters, both in the US and in Europe. Mark's firm has helped life sciences companies from large multinationals like you're seeing on the screen currently, as well as startups and everything in between in terms of size of firm. At Bioport USA supports life sciences companies to enter and succeed in the US healthcare market, which is obviously what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I will provide Mark's contact information at the end of the discussion today for anyone who would like to reach out to him afterwards as well. He's been kind enough to share his email and phone number on that slide, which you'll see at the end. Uh, just again, to reiterate, if you have any questions as we go, please put those questions into the Q&A panel and we will do our best to answer them all at the end. Uh, the presentation will run about 45 minutes. We'll leave time for Q&A. And then, as I mentioned, if anyone is interested in staying on and having a look at the platform, uh, I'll do a brief demo at the end um, as, as we go along. All right. So without any further uh, ado here, let's pass it over to Mark. Mark, I'll stop sharing and you can share on your end the slide deck. All right. As we're doing that, I believe Melanie is going to bring up a poll. So we're curious, just as you know, there's as I said, there are hundreds of companies signed up from six continents. Uh, we just like to know whether you're actively selling and or distributing your products in the U.S. currently. So yes, you are, or no, you're not currently selling into the U.S. And you can go ahead and and respond to that, and we'll post. There we go. Okay, interesting. About a 50-50 split, roughly. Wow. So, okay, Mark, over to you. Wonderful. Uh, first of all, Craig, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, you know, it's uh, always a pleasure to share uh, with companies across the world you know, what my team and I think it takes to be successful in the U.S. market. Um, today, we are going to cover four areas. Um, I'm going to try to touch briefly on the complexity of the US healthcare market, I think that even for American companies, uh, it is by far the, the most difficult vertical market there is, uh, in part because of regulatory bodies and uh, reimbursement and, and a few other extraordinary things that other vertical markets just don't have to deal with. Um, I will share some questions uh, that companies should consider before starting up here. I'll provide a brief overview of the US healthcare market. It's kind of a snapshot of, of where we are today. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, I put together a checklist, which I found to be quite helpful for our clients, uh, things they should be thinking of before they make the move. <clears throat> excuse me. 
And last but not least, uh, I want to touch briefly on uh, the reimbursement system. Uh, frankly, we have uh, the opportunity to do an entire seminar just on reimbursement, uh, just as we will on FDA in, in the coming weeks. But I wanted to at least provide a brief overview on this because I think all too often companies uh, overlook this. They are so focused on FDA, which clearly is important, but reimbursement is as well. So, excuse me, <clears throat> take a sip of water here. So, what is it you don't know about the U.S. healthcare market? Say it with me one time, Sherry. Show you the money. Oh, no, no, you can do better than that, Sherry. I want you to say it with you with me, then, brother. Hey, show me the money. Show me the money. Yeah. Show me the money. That's it, the money! Show me the money! So, for those of you who might be familiar with this, it's an oldie but a goodie. This is a clip from Jerry Maguire. Uh, with uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. and Tom Cruise. Uh, the point of me sharing this with you is that when you're dealing with a capitalistic based market economy, um, you deal with money. And yes, of course, uh, we are focused on uh, helping the healthcare provider uh, as well as the patient, uh, introducing them to new and better technology that can improve healthcare. But um, uh, I'm almost ashamed to admit it, it you know, money plays a huge role uh, in terms of uh, how successful you can be. So my word of advice to our clients is that if your product can't make money for the end user uh, and or save money, then you may want to consider twice about coming into the U.S. market, which I know comes across as very foreign, no pun intended, because the countries in which they operate in, money doesn't play quite as big a role. So uh, we'll just say that this is gonna be a theme for anything and everything that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, and it's certainly something you should be thinking about yourself as you get ready to either make the leap, which half of you have not. And for the other half that is already operating in the US, um, my hope is that there are maybe a thing or two that you'll be able to take away from this uh, that will have you reconsider what you're doing uh, in an effort to perhaps improve sales. Um, I brought up a slide here I call the nest. And all I'm trying to really show here, <clears throat> excuse me, is how challenging the US market can be, meaning there are so many different factors impacting uh, the decision making process, uh, be it from an insurance standpoint, be it from a, a purchasing standpoint. Uh, it's just not as simple and as straightforward as it may be in certain home countries uh, that you're familiar with uh, in terms of uh, how you go about doing business. You're not at home anymore. And the reason I say this is that all too often, some of our clients will uh, state that, well, this is how we do it in X, whether it be Germany, France, Finland, I, I do a lot of work in Western Europe. And I have to remind them, I said, look, with all due respect, uh, you may be familiar with the expression, when in Rome, do as the Romans. And, and I will be the first one to say that the Americans aren't much better. I mean, we have American companies that will travel overseas that I've helped with, and uh, they don't necessarily take into account the, the cultural differences and the mindset. But, uh, but that is definitely something you need to be looking at in an effort to also appreciate how complex the U.S. market is. And it's why I believe that going it alone is almost impossible. Um, you know, you may have some people that have worked here. Um, you may have some people have some understanding of the regulatory uh, pathway, but ultimately it's been my experience that, uh, especially for new entrants, that working with someone on this side of the Atlantic that has the experience, has been down that path, working with the FDA, has been down the path, working with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, services, also known as CMS, is just invaluable uh, because ultimately it does take uh, quite a bit of time to introduce new technology. <clears throat> Excuse me. And time is money, of course. So here are some questions that my team and I have put together uh, for you to consider before entering the U.S. healthcare market. One, have I developed a solution for which there is no problem? Um, in many instances, when I'm dealing with startups, uh, I'm dealing with some brilliant people. They're scientists, they're engineers, a uh, combination of both. And 
they may have literally been tinkering in their kitchen and have developed something which on the surface seems quite phenomenal, but then you have to step outside and look at the actual application. And, you know, frankly, uh, you have to appreciate that in America, at least, all the healthcare providers, they already have access to devices that enable them to do their job. Um, you know, so for you to come up with something new um, that would replace what they're doing is, is really the name of the game. And so if it's something that there really is no need for it, then it's a great science experiment, but it doesn't have any real applications in the marketplace. The second thing is, you know, what is the compelling need or pain that you're trying to solve? And I know this seems quite obvious, but it's just a friendly reminder to say, hey, what is it that you're going to do that is not only better for the patient, better for the healthcare provider, but the money question? Uh, is the product perhaps uh, going to be less expensive than what is currently available? Uh, is it something that will enable the hospital or the doctor or the clinic to make more money off? So this leads us into the third question. Um, again, you know, make sure that what you have can improve the healthcare's decision-making process as well as the outcome for the patient, but hopefully will also lower uh, costs of uh, taking care of that individual. The next question is, how is your product better or different from the competition? I think all too often companies say, well, you know, America is the largest healthcare market in the world. I just want my piece of the pie, as we say in America. Well, easier said than done. Um, and I think what's really important is for you to understand the competitive landscape. Uh, there are, have been even situations where I've dealt with European med tech companies that honestly do not have any competition in Europe. But lo and behold, it turns out they have three, four, or five competitors here. And I'll get into it later, but if, you know, if you're not prepared to deal with that, you definitely are going to run into some problems. Uh, because the last thing that the FDA wants is a, a Me Too product. And if there are several competitors already out there, then you have to begin to think about how am I going to differentiate myself from the competition besides looking at price or cost of your product. What is your reimbursement strategy? We touched uh, on that uh, briefly at the beginning. Um, just like you need to focus on developing a regulatory pathway, you need to be thinking about, you know, how is my product going to be reimbursable? You know, is there an existing uh, billing code, also known as a CPT code, that covers it? You know, what is the, the amount of reimbursement? Is it big enough to where it would be of interest to uh, the customer or, or not? So again, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. What is your go-to market plan, um, also known as a commercialization plan? You know, I don't quite understand how someone can go ahead and uh, come into the market without having some kind of plan in place. In fact, some people will say that even if you're an established business, uh, going into the U.S. market is basically like starting a new business all over. So putting a full-fledged business plan together uh, or in this case, I call it commercialization plan, uh, where you do take into account the resources, the money, the people that you're going to require, but also, you know, what path you're going to take. Uh, is this a product that you are going to want to sell on your own, under your own brand? Is it something you're going to want to license to someone? I love private label. So I think it's really important to have this because it's also a way in which to gauge your success. What's your story? Uh, we Americans are big uh, storytellers. We love stories. Um, and it's something that I'll touch base on uh, later on in a, a future uh, presentation that we'll do on, on sales and marketing and branding. Um, if you're going to go to market under your own brand, you really want to be able to be in a position to tell the story so that it's something that connects not only with the uh, end user, um, i.e. provider, but also the patient. And last but not least, you know, do you have the necessary resources? Unfortunately, I have met a number of companies uh, that are woefully undercapitalized. I think they do not appreciate how much money it really takes to be successful in the U.S. market. Uh, and that's where the market go-to market plan or commercialization plan comes in. If you put this together correctly, you can also try to put together a budget to say, what is it going to take for me to successfully get into the market? keeping in mind that it could take upwards of two years to do so based on what type of technology, what kind of studies you need to do, 
um, and what have you. Do we have a poll question coming up for this? No, it's coming up later. Yep, no, here we go. Let's see. Waiting for the results. Okay. So it looks like we've got developing a regulatory pathway number one at 42 percent followed by sales and marketing which uh, doesn't surprise me and then of course reimbursement strategy is 11 percent and i guess it really depends on uh who the companies are that are uh, participating with us today because uh depending on your technology uh having a reimbursement strategy is going to be critical uh in achieving a, a certain level of success uh i.e understanding you know, what is it that the doctor or the hospital is actually earning uh, based on pre-existing codes versus have you developed such an innovative technology for which there currently isn't a reimbursement code, which is something we'll talk about at the very end when I talk about managing payers. Okay, moving on. A brief snapshot of the, the changing US healthcare market. So, when you look at the American landscape, there are basically three things that you need to be thinking of. You know, is my product desirable? Is it feasible? And is it sustainable? And with each one of them, there is a risk associated with it. Um, and I thought it was appropriate to share this with you because my experience has been that most international med tech companies that I've dealt with are extremely risk averse. Um, I can appreciate that to some extent. Uh, I would say that we Americans are perhaps a little bit higher on the scale of risk taking, um, which is why you'll see in a minute uh, some steps that I recommend to clients to try to de-risk the, uh, the opportunity to come in here. But you really have to think about this. You know, Is this something that what you've developed, is it desirable in the US market? You know, is it something that is actually feasible? And can you keep it going? you know, for a period of time uh, in order to get it introduced into the market, hence the financial risk, because I think for most new product introductions, you're looking at least at two years. You need the finances to sustain that and to uh, build the pathway. I've said this before, you'll hear this common theme, you know, the name of the game in the US marketplace is to, is to reduce cost and demonstrate value and improve conditions. This has become even more pivotal since COVID. I can tell you that before COVID, uh, sure, uh, containing costs, managing costs in the United States was important, but um, since COVID, it has become critical. There are some hospitals in the United States that have actually gone out of business uh, because of not being able to, to manage the costs, which I know to some of our foreign um, folks might seem implausible. Anyway, here's what the market looks like today. $3.1 trillion uh, in overall sales. Uh, that, it's huge, uh, 4,500 hospitals, but there's consolidation going on. And we anticipate that within 10 years, you're probably gonna have 150 healthcare systems. That doesn't mean that the 4,500 hospitals has gone away. It just means that they're now owned uh, by 150 uh, institutions, which will have a certain impact on I think healthcare as we know it. Uh, I think among other things, it could unfortunately have a negative impact in terms of cost to the patient. Uh, currently, uh, the way the structure is for hospitals, 58% uh, are not-for-profit and community-based, 21% are uh, government-owned, um, and 21% are uh, for-profit private hospitals. And where that comes into play is, you know, the types of services that you're looking to get and the costs associated with them. 
Total sales for uh, medical technology last year was 187 billion. So again, it's the largest market by far in the United States. Uh, it represents, that number represents 41% of total volume of grow global sales. So clearly almost half the sales of medical technology happen here, which explains why companies uh, from outside the United States wanna be here. Uh, you know, it's, it's the biggest market. The number that I wanted to focus on with the group is the number of employees, meaning the average number of employees in a American med tech company is less than 50. And I think that should be encouraging uh, to some of the small to medium sized companies that may be listening today, because there's only so many Medtronics or 3Ms or Strikers out there. Uh, the majority of companies uh, are small and uh, they're doing extremely well. Um, and that should then be of encouragement to uh, European or Southeast Asian or India or wherever you're coming from to say, hey, you know what, I can make it here too if I you know, follow certain rules. I thought this was an interesting slide to share. Um, 25 years ago, you had more people staying longer periods of time inpatient, depending on what the procedure is. And as you can see, that number has drastically changed over this time. In fact, if I were to update, I'm waiting for the numbers for 2021, um, I would venture to guess that we're at 60% outpatient and 40% inpatient. And really what we're drawing on here um, is hospitals in an effort to make money are just trying to get people out of hospital beds as quickly as possible and replace them with the next patient. Uh, one anecdote I can share with you is a, a friend of mine um, his mother recently uh, had major surgery. Uh, she had uh, a part of her lung taken out uh, on a Tuesday. So that's big surgery. And on Friday, she was discharged. So think about it. You know, three days after her major procedure, she was already sent home. In the past, that patient would have stayed in the, in the hospital for at least two weeks. But it's money. You know, it's money that's costing... Uh, the insurance company um, and it's money that's costing the hospital. Uh, so let's, you know, let's get that bed free and, and get the next patient in there. Here's a checklist that we put together that we think uh, is something that can help uh, our clients with market entry into the US. Number one, have a business plan. Again, I'm, I'm gonna reiterate some of the things that I, I touched on earlier. Um, I can't stress how important it is to have this. The, the best the metaphor I could come up with is that if you're going to build a house, a brand new house, no matter where you are, uh, in, in Mexico, in London, in Japan, you're, you're going to want to have a blueprint. Uh, I mean, I don't think of anyone who would ever build a house without having a blueprint to understand, you know, what the house is going to look like. And, and that's what I think you need to look at here. You know, you need to have a blueprint put into place so that uh, you know exactly where you're gonna go, you're gonna have a general sense of how much it's gonna cost. Um, and so that if you do come into some problems, you can adjust accordingly. I talked earlier about de-risking. Um, we think that one of the ways you can de-risk your uh, success of market entry in the US is to do one of two things or both. One is to do an opportunity assessment, which really involves you talking to the ultimate customer of your products, in this case, doctors or nurse practitioners or, 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 or nurses or physician's assistants, you know, show it to them. Uh, you know, you haven't even done anything with the FDA. You haven't done anything with anyone. You're just saying, let me show you my product. Let me tell you about it. Is this something you think, uh, you know, might be of interest to you? And if you do that enough, you begin to see a pattern. And I think that can be extremely valid uh, and valuable. In addition, I encourage uh, our clients to do uh, a, what's called a market landscape, which is some secondary market research that also looks at the competitive landscape so that you know what you're in for, you know how you fit in, you know what you need to do to differentiate yourself and how to best prepare for success into the US market. The next thing we took on is look at your patents. Um, you know, all too often people say, oh yeah, I'm already registered. Uh, with the US Patent Office, and, and that's great, but it's not good enough. Um, we encourage people to do either a patent landscape uh, or a full-blown freedom to operate because one of the main reasons is if an American competitor feels as if you are threatening them, 
uh, because your technology is just so wonderful, uh, the first thing they're going to do is have their legal counsel look at your patents. And if they feel as if your patents somehow infringe on their patents, they're, they're going to take you to court. So you know, before you can even see the light of day, you're, you find yourself in an American courthouse. So that's one of the reasons we say, you know, that's not necessary if you take the necessary precautions before you enter the US market. Uh, the next thing we talk about is, is a market launch pad. This is actually a, a readiness assessment that Bioport put together. It covers 32 different points. And it, it looks at everything as if you're going to establish a business here. So this is meant more for companies that are going to uh, develop a subsidiary in the US. It looks at legal implications. It looks at financial. It looks at insurance, operational, as well, of course, regulatory reimbursement, sales and marketing, branding, the whole uh, kit of what you need to be thinking of. Um, you know, one of the questions that comes up when we're dealing with clients is their fear of being sued. Um, and we are a very litigious uh, country, um, but that's why having insurance comes into play. So we say, you know what, we've got that covered. But again, something that uh, could be of interest to people. Develop a regulatory pathway. You know, I saw that that certainly seemed high on, uh, on people's list, which is good to know. Uh, and what I mean by that is sometimes people just assume that they're going for 510K uh, or maybe it's a de novo. Uh, and I honestly don't know what, what they're basing it on because what will happen is we'll go back and we'll look at this and say, hey, you know, is it really 510K exempt? This is a true client. Uh, maybe you should be looking at 510K approved uh, because among other things, it'll give you a competitive edge, uh, seeing how your competitors are all 510k exempt, but you're going to go ahead and do a full-blown clinical study uh, that will enable you then to also differentiate yourself from the competition. So that's just one example of when you're doing a regulatory path, we determine not only what you need to definitely do so that you can you know, have success in selling your product in the U.S., but how can you also potentially differentiate yourself from the competition? Market access, reimbursement. <clears throat> I will admit that there are some situations where depending on what your product is, there may already be an existing reimbursement code. You've done the research, you know it's there and you're like, check, you know, off we go. But I would still implore you to take a closer look at it and saying, wait a second, how much money, you know, is the company, uh, not the company, the hospital, the clinic or the physician getting reimbursed for utilizing your particular type of technology? And if yours is a little bit different than what they're currently using, there may be other codes that come into play, which now all of a sudden make your product even that much more attractive because they may be able to get more money back uh, versus what they're currently using. So that's just one example. We can certainly go into some more, but, but I think it's important to take a look at that. Um, if it turns out that you have such an innovative technology, which one of my clients has, where there is no existing code, you have to keep in mind that it can take upwards to two years to actually get a code assigned to you. That's critical in terms of your go-to-market strategy because until you have that reimbursement code, it doesn't matter if you have FDA approval, it doesn't matter how well-priced your product is, no one's gonna buy it unless it's something that's being utilized you know, for serving the rich and famous because in that case, reimbursement doesn't matter. Legal and insurance, I think that speaks for itself. Um, you know, you, you should make sure to have uh, the, the proper uh, entity put in place. I, I would encourage companies that even if they do not establish a full-blown uh, man subsidiary in the U.S., that they do consider establishing a U.S. business entity as a means of creating a buffer between the parent company uh, and any potential lawsuit that would come from a U.S. customer. Uh, ultimately, it can impact the parent company, but at least having that buffer in place helps, uh, as does having the proper insurance. Sales and distribution, again, this is a, a topic that we will talk more about uh, at a, a future uh, event that's being organized by My Caribou. Um, but I, I just do want to you know, stress that it's not just good enough to sign up a distributor uh, at a trade show that you may have exhibited at and then you expect sales to just automatically uh, come in. Uh, au contraire, I remember having a German client come to me and says, hey, you know, I, I signed up this US distributor. 
Uh, he was all gung ho. This was six months ago. And, you know, I've gotten no sales, nothing. And the first question I had for that German company is I said, well, what did you do to support that distributor? And he kind of looked at me with a blank stare. What I'm trying to explain is that if you don't have some type of marketing program in place, if you don't have some type of maybe incentive program in place, you, you have to do something. If you don't have an educational program in place, you need to be able to do something to help that distributor sell your products. Branding and marketing, that's something else we'll, we'll talk in conjunction with sales and distribution. All I'll say on this uh, at this point in time is that if you're going to go to market under your own brand, which some companies really should because of uh, you know, the amount of money they can make, uh, A, be prepared to spend some money and more so than what you're used to in your home country. Remember, we're storytellers. And so um, you'll see a stat that I'll reveal uh, now that you should be prepared to spend between 8 and 10% of your gross annual sales uh, on marketing, which may seem like a decent number. I mean, if you're doing $10 million, uh, you know, we're saying in sales, we're saying, yeah, spend a million dollars on this, which may seem uh, obscene for a lot of the international companies, but it truly is going to make a difference in trying to position yourself in the marketplace, especially if your brand is not well known. And last but not least, you know, we do uh, remind people that having some type of back office operations is important, especially if you're, you know, multiple time zones away. Uh, Americans, I just heard it again last night, we are just used to dealing with Americans, you know, nothing against uh, uh, people where English is a second language, but I can tell you there is just this ongoing um, theme, if you may, where Americans are becoming uh, more and more annoyed of, of you know, talking to people that they, they can't understand uh, from a customer service standpoint. Um, if they're dealing with financial transactions, accounting, uh, Americans want to feel as if they're doing business with Americans, even if the business is overseas. So we're now approaching the, the last part of the presentation, uh, which is managing payers and planning for successful reimbursement. Pardon me while I just have a sip of water. You all have recognized and acknowledged in the first poll question how important the FDA is, and it absolutely is. And, and you know, I look forward to inviting all of you uh, to join us for our next presentation in the coming weeks, which will be solely dedicated just to the FDA, because the FDA is not as straightforward as one might think. It is not black and white. You know, yes, you can go to the FDA website, and yes, it'll say certain things. Uh, but uh, unless you have a regulatory specialist on staff who really knows the ins and outs, and even then some, you know, things got a little strange, if you may, as a result of COVID. Uh, but what I want to spend uh, the last uh, couple of minutes talking with you today is looking at the barriers that are associated with securing payer coverage, because without having that in place, you have no market in the U.S., I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. The, the, the purpose though of this graphic is to show you the complexity. I decided uh, for those of you from Europe uh, who are joining us today, um, to just to give you an example of you know, how I think it's relatively straightforward, uh, how the EU in particular uh, handles uh, reimbursement. I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that uh, most countries in the world have uh, some form of universal health care. We do not. The closest that we have in America is, um, and you'll see this in a second, is what we call the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, let me go on to this one. Uh, Medicare is insurance that uh, people get uh, starting at the age of 65, so I call it insurance for the old. Medicaid is insurance for the poor, meaning people who live below the poverty line, which unfortunately that number is, is quite high for a country as rich as ours. That's the closest we have to some form of universal health care. I mean, you look at the two numbers together, it's about 61%. Uh, the 1.5% number here represents the Veterans Administration, for those of you not familiar with. Uh, the, you know, after World War II, uh, the United States government set up uh, uh, not only a health care plan, but also built hospitals to serve uh, those men and women who have served in the armed forces, whether it's in active military battles uh, or just active military period. Um, 
I only share this with you because they think there are about 170 hospitals throughout the United States. And for some of you, the VA could be a very interesting market depending on what type of technology, uh, i.e. if you, for example, are a manufacturer of prosthetics, uh, you're gonna have a, a much higher hit rate working with the VA than probably any other hospital. Unfortunately, due to combat injuries where uh, you know, American soldiers have lost limbs. And then 36.9 or almost 37% represent uh, the private sector. Um, I know that you have private health insurance in, in a lot of the, the countries that are probably visiting us today. So you probably have an understanding of you know, what can be involved with them. All I'll say to it this morning is that these are usually employer-based uh, provided. Um, and depending on what the patient or the individual wants, um, you can have just a, a, a myriad of options. So uh, I may have the same insurance as, as my neighbor, let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield, but I may decide to have certain perks that he doesn't have. And as a result, my premium will be higher, my monthly premium, my deductible will be less, and I will have access to more services. So it's, it's, it's an interesting system that we have here few slides on, on just explaining. Uh, so the pillars of reimbursement are, are do basically have three elements. You've got coverage, coding, and payment. You know, with coverage, we're, we're just referring to, you know, what is it that the insurance company is willing to reimburse, you know, for the product or service? Not everything is automatically covered. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that if you don't have something that is, has a pre-existing billing code, it could take upwards to two years just because of the analysis uh, and the data that you need to put forth to uh, the insurance provider. Uh, then you have coding. Uh, this is something that many of you may be familiar with, especially for those that are already operating in the US. These are existing CPT codes or ICDD-10 codes that a physician's office uses for the different types of services that, you, uh, that they render to the patient. Um, and then there's payment. Uh, depending on what kind of insurance you have, there's preset numbers of what the uh, insurance provider is willing to pay. So I think the, the biggest complaint that we have in the United States is uh, Medicare uh, and Medicaid for that matter. So they both fall under CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. What do I mean by that? Uh, Medicare and Medicaid tend to provide the lowest uh, refund or repayment for services rendered. And so if you look at a patient's bill, you know, they may go see someone and it'll cost uh, $250 or $400 if you did not have insurance, but Medicare has this, you know, pre-agreed uh, rate and they may reimburse the doctor $75 uh, and that's it. Um, well, think about it. If I could be earning $400 versus 75 at some point in time, you know, I may just get sick and tired of it. And there have been situations where some physicians just don't take Medicare anymore. Moving on to the next thing. So we have what's considered a multi-payer system for reimbursement. Uh, and I think this applies though, predominantly to uh, more so the private insurance companies based on what I just said, than Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, the stakeholders here are the payers, which are the insurance companies. Uh, I'm sorry, the... Um, Oh yeah, no, the payers, the providers, which are the facilities, the physicians, and of course the patient. Um, the payer, you know, will look at, you know, what it is that the physician's doing um, and look at the hospital setting and come up with a predetermined number <clears throat> of what they think, uh, you know, they'll go ahead and do uh, from a reimbursement standpoint. Uh, you know, the provider is, in this case, uh, the hospital, the clinic, the physician, the nurse, and of course, the patient is the recipient of these particular uh, services. And what will happen is, and I, again, I touched on it just briefly, is that depending on what the cost is, the patient will have a copay. So if you're privately insured, uh, if you're working with someone in network, you know, it may be $20 copay. If it's someone out of network, it may be a $45 copay. And, and you're thinking to yourself, well, why do I need to know all this? Because depending on what it is that you are selling uh, will ultimately depend on how much money 
that provider, i.e. physician, will make. And so if your cost, for example, of a, a product is significantly less, uh, let's say it's $2,500 instead of $25,000, which is the cost of, the, of his existing piece of equipment, and he can use the same CPT codes, the same billing codes, so he's getting reimbursed the same dollar amount, even if it's a lower dollar amount, he's going to find your solution much more attractive than what he's currently using because A, he can pay off the, the piece of equipment that he bought from you much quicker, and therefore he starts making money uh, a lot sooner. More money, I should say. I won't talk too much about this just because I, you know it, it could take a, a whole hour just to go through this, but again, I'm using this not unlike the, the first couple of slides to show how complex this whole process is. And it's something that I think a lot of companies in the medical technology space aren't taking into consideration, but probably should to better position their product in an effort uh, for people to buy it uh, because of looking at the, what I'll call a reimbursement pathway. So the last couple of slides that we have here, some do's and don'ts that I've, I've put together here from a reimbursement planning perspective. Don't make any assumptions. You know, uh, you have no idea what uh, the stakeholders are, are willing to do or not do. Uh, you have to do the homework. You need to look into this. You need to research uh, the numbers. Again, even if there's an existing billing code to say, wait a second, what is it that you know, the doctor will get if they use this? If, they, if my particular technology allows them to use multiple billing codes, you know, that ultimately then also impacts uh, the sales process in terms of how your sales uh, people go out and position the market, uh, the product in the market. You know, do look at the reimbursement pathway or develop one. Uh, you know, understand how the coding mechanism works, uh, which again is not that easy uh, without having you know access to someone. Um, there are deadlines for uh, submitting coding submissions. Um, so again. Even here, not unlike on the regulatory side, uh, you've got things that you need to be thinking of from a, a planning perspective. Um, if you go ahead and have to put in a new code application, you need to create, in this case, what's called evidence plan focused on value. Um, and you definitely need to understand your payer mix. You know, is your product going to be geared more towards senior citizens, in which case coverage is gonna come from Medicare? Uh, or is it something that will have maybe more of an application uh, that will be covered by private insurance companies? And I will say this, that there will be uh, certain types of coverage that the private insurance companies will be more generous on than Medicare and Medicaid, even though they are the golden standard. They are the torchbearers. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service is the one that establishes what you know, things should be reimbursed at. So last slide, um, there is a paradigm shift that's happening in the US, uh, again, because of money. And, and basically what it's saying is that in the past we would reward volume. So you'd, you'd almost see uh, doctors doing you know, four surgeries a day and, and here you go, because they knew that there was a preset dollar amount and hey, this is great, you know, get them in, get them out and off we go. Um, the Insurance industry, though, is changing. They said, you know what? We've done a lot of analysis of costs in, involved with this. And we are in, in a position where we think that a certain surgery should cost X. So let's say the surgery costs $20,000. Um, we're prepared to pay $20,000 for this type of procedure. It's up to the hospital now or the physician to figure out, well, if we can actually do this procedure for $10,000, we've just made an extra $10,000. If on the other hand, it, you know, it costs the hospital and the physician $30,000, guess what? They're still only getting $20,000. So it's really putting a lot of pressure on the, the healthcare providers to determine how they can provide still good healthcare at an affordable cost uh, because uh, the cost of healthcare in the United States is just spiraling out of control. Uh, I'll end with this to, to, just to make my point. Today, we are spending almost 19% of our gross domestic product on healthcare. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to uh, answering any questions you may have.
Great. So uh, thank you, Mark. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, I'll wrap up with some Q&A here. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. I do see several in there now. And I'll, I'll get started on those. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Just give me half a second. Um, and we will also wrap up a couple slides towards the end here. And I'll do a demo of the platform at, at the very end if you want to stay on for that. So, okay, so let's have a, have a look here. I'm going to try to bundle some of these together because there are some overlapping questions. Um, so earlier on in the presentation, Mark, you talked a little bit about uh, determining demand uh, for products in the U.S. market. So questions around how can I determine, what are some ways to determine whether there is going to be demand for my product in the U.S. market? So let's touch on that one first. Sure, and I think this goes back to uh, my checklist where I talk about doing an opportunity assessment. Um, you know, there is a way um, to reach out to either physicians directly uh, and or trade associations that uh, involve physicians, uh, physician groups, especially, you know, you know, what it is, is it cardiologist, ophthalmologist, neurologist, what have you, um, and or certain hospitals, uh, research facilities to say, hey, I've got this really cool product and here's what it does. You know, is this something you think that could make a difference in how you, you know, operate your, your daily practice? And believe it or not, you know, most uh, Americans are, are pretty open to, to providing advice. They, they like to talk about these things. So it's really a question of just going out there and asking the respective target audience uh, to give them feedback on what you have to have. Because mind you, you're not selling, right? You're just asking them for their feedback. But you can also appreciate that in the process of asking them for their feedback, at some point in time, you might leverage that to go back and actually sell it to them, especially if they like what you've developed. Okay, great. Let's, um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit to reimbursement. There are several questions around reimbursement, which I, I don't think is uh, surprising. But um, so I'll, I'll ask you a few on this topic, Mark. Uh, so first one is, uh, what if there isn't a reimbursement code that matches my products? So let's start there. And then I got a couple of follow ups for you. So this is where I, I referenced briefly in the presentation that um, that that is, well, I'll answer it in two ways. Depending on what the product is, um, you may not have to worry about it because if it's something that, again, I, I use the word, uh, appeals to the lifestyles of the rich and famous. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I met a German company once that developed a, a certain type of laser that was used for dermat dermatological procedures. And it was about $1,000 a pop uh, to utilize. Um, this company didn't worry about reimbursement because they were selling their, their product to both dermatologists as well as plastic surgeons in the United States. And their customer base didn't care if they had to pay $1,000 every time they had to utilize it. But that's the exception. Uh, you know, I have another client that has developed just a phenomenal technology uh, utilizing artificial intelligence uh, to automate brain MRI scans. Wonderful. I mean, it's really quite amazing. Well, guess what? There's no existing code for it. And there will be a process that they will need to go through to work with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, utilizing clinical data. So first of all, they have to get FDA approval to then put together a healthcare economic analysis uh, to provide uh, Medicare and Medicaid with data that substantiates why they should go ahead and get a code assigned to them and then also determining what that dollar amount should be. And that process literally takes anywhere between 18 and 24 months. So that is something you need to incorporate in your planning process so that you don't lose even more time in trying to uh, access the US market. Okay, and following on on reimbursement, um, are there different codes used in different states for the same product because the amount of reimbursement may be different? Right, so um, to the best of my knowledge, the, the codes are the, what the codes are. Um, you know, they're, they're set at, at a federal level. However, the type of reimbursement could be different. Uh, so that is a good question. Uh, depending on where you operate your product in states, uh, there will be other contributing factors that will influence how much uh, that product will be reimbursed, uh, you know, at a state level, uh, especially if it's, um, the private insurance company. So something that you also want to look into uh, when you're accessing the United States uh, and looking at where you might even want to start selling your products to begin with. 
Okay, I think this one was from the same person as a follow-on to that. Um, can you use two different codes at one time if your product can be altered to fit either code? Yes. Okay. I think that covers the reimbursement questions as I try to group these together. So let's, um, let's speak to the next one here is around the litigious nature of the U.S. market. So uh, U.S. market is known for being uh, quite litigious. How can I protect my company from lawsuits? Well, and this is where you know the the the, the easy or the simple answer is: you just get the right insurance. You know, even American companies have insurance, and yes, the premiums can be a little bit high, but that's really what protects you and gives you peace of mind. You know, if someone turns around and, and, and sues you for a million dollars, you know, the first thing that happens if you have the proper insurance is the insurance company gets involved to, to do the investigating, to look at it uh, and to determine whether or not, you know, there, there's a real case here. Uh, to me, it's worth every penny that you would pay in a, an upfront premium. It's also the price to pay for, again, having peace of mind. You shouldn't let the fact that we Americans tend to be more sue happy than the rest of the world keep you from entering the U.S. market. The other thing uh, which I referenced is to create a buffer between yourself, meaning the parent company, um, and, and the U.S. subsidiary. So establish a U.S. subsidiary, create a legal business entity, uh, and do all of your business through that U.S. Uh, legal business entity. Um, that plus insurance will help provide a great deal of protection, especially making sure that uh, the parent company uh, doesn't necessarily uh, in, you know, endure any of the uh, potential fallout that may come from a lawsuit. Um, just going back to reimbursement, there were a couple of follow-on questions here. Uh, so the question around reimbursement is we're speaking about products being reimbursed, but I thought procedures were reimbursed. Can you clarify, please? No. So what happens is things get, the, and, and that's the future, right? So the future, uh, the, the direction that uh, CMS wants to go into is to reimburse a procedure. And there are lots of different things that happen within the course of a procedure. But if you were to look at a bill, and I accidentally got one from a hospital when I had hernia operation done years ago, so I actually got to see it firsthand. It was amazing. It was a simple hernia repair, nothing major. It wasn't open heart surgery. And I think my, my, my bill was something like 10 pages long because they literally are billing for every single thing, including every pill I took. You know, one Tylenol, $10 or something like that. It was insane. Now, they have these, what I consider hyperinflated prices that the hospital is charging because if you don't have insurance, and that's the problem here in the United States, you are in, you can be in a world of hurt. Um, what happens with the insurance companies is they'll look at this and say, that's great that you have a, you know, a, a price for this and a price for that and a price for that uh, in terms of getting back to the question on, on, on the, the device itself. No, there is going to be a cost for uh, the, the technology that's being used. There's also going to be a cost for the work that uh, uh, the doctor's doing. So again, let's say it's a surgery. Uh, there'll be, there will be a, a, a cost associated with the, the surgery itself. Uh, but then depending on what type of device you might be utilizing, there could be a, you know, a way that they're going to bill or get reimbursed for that as well. Okay, there are additional questions coming in around uh, reimbursement. I think what I'm gonna do just for sake of time, um, we always do this in these sessions because we, we tend to run out of time, uh, but we'll, we'll follow up in our um, email follow-up afterwards in the presentation, which will include the deck and will include a link to the, um, uh, to the recording of this. We'll also include some follow-up to a few of these additional questions that are pretty specific. Uh, so we'll do that afterwards. Um, I'm just gonna ask maybe one more, Mark. Um, uh, so it's, it's about if a manufacturer is gonna set up an office in the US, does it matter where they set up that office? And I think we'll make this the last question and then I'll wrap up with um, uh, the next series uh, topics. So let's just so, hit this one quickly. Yeah, no, so... Um... <clears throat> If they're going to set up an office in the United States where they're actually going to, so the two-part answer to this, uh, Craig, if they're going to set up a, an office where they're ultimately going to um, have it manned, because you can set up an office in the United States and, and it's just, you know, it's a postal box address, if you may. 
but let's just assume it's a real legitimate office with, with man personnel. Uh, one of the things that I uh, advise our clients on is, and this may seem a little odd at first, but then I think it makes sense is set it up in some instances across the street from where your competition is because getting uh, human resources is one of the most challenging things in the United States right now. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not a bad idea to be in a close vicinity um, of where uh, the competition is located right now. If you're looking at it from a taxation standpoint, every state has uh, different taxes. Um, clearly, a lot of people set up a Delaware corporation uh, more from a business standpoint. Um, but if I wanted to set up a business uh, in a state where I wasn't incurring a lot of taxes and I wasn't incurring a lot of administrative fees, uh, the best state in the union is the state of Nevada. Go figure. Maybe it's because they make so much money off the gaming industry. Okay, great. I'm going to um, wrap the Q&A there for now. Just uh, really quickly wanted to hit on um, this was part or is part one of a three-part series on the U.S. market. Uh, we'll also be doing other markets uh, around the world as well. Uh, part two will be on uh, more specifics around the U.S. regulatory requirements, um, which Mark alluded to earlier. And then part three is going to be focused on sales and branding strategies in the U.S. market. Uh, which will be a, a deeper dive into distribution models, be they regional, national, uh, specialized, full line, exclusive, et cetera, um, uh, direct, indirect, all kinds of different options there. Uh, so that will be part three. So keep an eye out for an email on those uh, sessions. Um, you'll have to sign up for them separately from today's. Uh, on that note, I want to thank Mark uh, for his time today and, and insight. Uh, his, his contact information is published here. Um, as is mine, if anybody wants to reach out to us. Uh, it, My Caribou is a, is a free platform to join. Uh, the sign up link is on this page as well. There are over 44,000 uh, manufacturers, distributor profiles on the platform today. I am going to do a, a brief uh, demo here uh, in a moment. But um, again, Mark, I want to thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, we'll send around a copy of the deck an answer to any follow-up questions that we didn't get to today, which I see there are several. Um, and, uh, and then feel free to reach out to Mark if you're looking for help uh, coming into the U.S. market. Uh, great company, great resource. And um, on that note, I will, I will just switch screens here and give you a quick overview for anyone who's interested in the My Caribou platform today. Um, if, if you're dropping off, thank you for your time. If you're staying on, I'm going to try to do this in about five or six minutes. I'm going to keep it very short because you can sign up uh, within minutes and uh, actually start navigating the platform yourself. And as you'll see here, it's very, very easy to use. Uh, so there are basically four aspects to the platform, dashboards, discovering markets, uh, finding and discovering, connecting with new partners, and then collaborating with your partners. So the view you're seeing here today, right now is the market discovery view. Uh, we were just talking about the US market, so maybe I'll use that one as an example. Uh, green markets are markets that I am active in as a manufacturer in this case. These purple markets are markets that I'm interested in going to. And I've actually just basically flagged those as target markets around the world. But you could also click on another country and make it a target market for you. But let's use the US really quickly as an example. We have over 80,000 data points on 105 markets. So one of the things that Mark talked about is understanding the market you're going into. What this actually allows you to do is drill into that market and, and learn about uh, uh, various data points in the market. So things like Mark spoke to private public spending in the market, um, uh, various types of uh, spending by function. We have healthcare assets, number of hospitals, number of beds, number of physicians, number of clinical physicians. So for example, if you sell into uh, pediatricians, you would see that there are 60,000 of those in the US market. Um, similarly, if you want to drill into utilization statistics, things like diagnostics, exams, surgeries, surgeries by area or clinical area, we have all that data as well. Uh, trends and indicators around various medical conditions and disease states, as well as regulatory data. Uh, so this we do on 105 countries. So whether you're looking at markets in Europe, in Asia, Africa, uh, South America, Latin America, et cetera, uh, we have that in 105 countries. From there, we have the ability to help you go find partners. So for example, if I was a manufacturer and I was looking for distribution capabilities in a particular market, 
I can simply go into the partnering view here and I'm able to uh, filter and find and potentially connect with partners. So I'll just give you an example. Let's say I was looking for a distributor and maybe I'll do uh, the Brazilian market as an example. So I'm looking for Brazilian distributors and let's say my products are cardiovascular. So I'm looking for uh, cardiovascular distributors. The 44,000 companies you're seeing up here will now sub filter down into 93 companies from which I can see, you know, Valflux group all the way down the list here. You have the ability then to, to view the profile of that company. You could view their full profile. You could even bring up their website, their LinkedIn page, uh, learn more about this particular company. And when you're ready to, you could then connect with that company through the platform. And in many cases, they're going to ask you some questions, uh, understanding why you want to connect. And, you know, in my case, I'm a manufacturer, might ask me a few questions about my certifications or, you know, why I'm ready to go to the Brazilian market, that kind of thing. We also have something called uh, finding opportunities. And I'm going to just switch over to the live platform because these are real opportunities that have been posted. So these are um, companies that are looking for, I'm going to use this example right here. Uh, this is a manufacturer uh, based in the UK that is looking for distribution partners. Um, and they're looking for those partners in these markets. So it looks like um, uh, the Caribbean, Central America, uh, is what they're looking for. And they describe what type of partnerships they're looking for. And as a distributor, then I could respond to them uh, and, and potentially establish a partnership. Uh, similarly, distributors are, are in here posting opportunities as well, um, looking for products, for example. Um, so you'll, you'll see examples of that in here as well. Like for example, this one is an Egyptian manufacturer looking for a particular product to sell into the Egyptian market. Um, so partnering is really finding um, and connecting with partners. And then lastly, collaborating is a place where you can uh, work with your partners, collaborate together. Uh, so for example, why don't I do, um, I'll give you just give you an example of one here. This is a partnership between me, Global Cardio, a manufacturer, and my UK distributor, XYZ Distributors. And what we have here is the ability to basically forecast sales together have discussions, uh, manage files, have conversations with, with our partner, as well as business plans. So as you think about your go-to-market strategies, how are we gonna succeed in the market? One of the things that Mark talked about was, you know, have a, have a business plan, have a marketing plan, have a sales plan ready. How are you gonna support the distributor, et cetera? And we can do all that in the platform through our collaborative, collaborative workspaces. So for example, my case, you know, I've got a partner in Spain, one in Italy, one in the UK, one in Germany, one in the US and so on. And in each of those cases, these are secure workspaces where I can collaborate with those partners. If you're doing that, you then have the ability to, to view dashboards for how you're performing in markets around the world, as well as how you're performing with each of your partners. So for example, here, I can see my market performance in markets that I'm active in. I can also see which of my partners we're having the most success with. Um, as well as overall sales forecast globally, uh, reaching across all these different partnerships. So that's a whirlwind view. I try to do this in five or six minutes. Um, the reality is the link is in the uh, PowerPoint today. Maybe, um, Melanie, if you don't mind posting the sign up link right into the chat panel link in case anyone wants to click on that right now. Um, so dashboarding, viewing and discovering markets finding and connecting with new partners and collaborating with your existing partners is what this platform is all about. It is free to sign up. You have 30 days to utilize the platform at no cost. Everything you saw here today, after 30 days, there is an annual subscription fee um, if you decide to move forward. It is always free, just to be very clear, to have your profile in MyCaribou. Okay, so your profile is actually managed right here, your company profile. That is always free as it is to respond to connection requests and outreach from other companies around the world. Those two aspects are free uh, in perpetuity. Everything else you're seeing here is part of the subscription platform uh, after the 30 days. So um, again, that's a really quick overview. I hope that uh, was useful for people that wanted to see the platform today. 
Um, as I mentioned, you can sign up for free. I believe Melanie has now posted the sign up. Yep, the sign up link is in there. So on that note, I wanna thank everyone. We will send you a follow-up email afterwards with the PowerPoint presentation, um, as well as a link to the recording and an answer to some of the questions we missed today. Again, I'll thank Mark for participating and uh, Melanie and RN for organizing this uh, session today. Uh, there are two more coming in this US market uh, series, as I mentioned one around regulatory and one around sales and distribution um, are options as you look to go to a market like the US and we'll send out some invitations to those as they are teed up in terms of dates and times. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.